Montana Territory in the early 1880s was changing from a raw and hostile frontier. The inevitable western expansion of a growing nation pushed the Plains Indian off his hunting grounds and onto the reservation. All across the eastern half of Montana Territory, the very face of the land had changed in a few short years. Out on the wide plains, the millions of buffalo from the great northern herd were systematically gunned down. Hunters took only the hides and tongues and left the rest for the coyotes and vultures. The Indian Wars were over and the new railroad brought towns and created shipping points at old outposts like Mile City. As far as the bullwhacker freighters and the buffalo hunters were concerned, the coming of the railroad marked the end of the Wild West they had known. For the Indian tribes, the trappers and adventurers, it was if the country had changed overnight. By the mid-1880s, the range was heavily stocked with cattle from Texas. There were big profits to be made in driving herds of cheap Texas cattle north to Montana. Eastern investors put up the money and cowboys were hired to move the cattle north. On the northern ranges, the cattle grew fat on free grass. Come fall, the new railroad carried them east to market. It was a time of abundant forage, plenty of water and mild winters. The range was free, the cattle were cheap, and labor was even cheaper. Cowboys and trail drovers worked for about $40 a month, plus whatever pound they could get from the chuck wagon. On the 1882 market, a 1,200-pound steer brought an average price of $57. After that, prices started dropping, but that didn't stop those enthusiastic investors in the cattle business. During the spring of 1886, 100,000 more southern cattle were pushed across the rivers and crowded onto the Montana range. But it was a range that was now parched by a year of drought. The summer was dry and hot. Grass was stunted. From the crazy mountains to the Dakotas, water holes turned to baked, cracked mud. Cattle prices dropped even lower, so the owners decided to hold their herds over the winter until the market improved. That fall, an early winter storm hit. In late January, the great blizzard hit the country. 
The warm Chinook winds didn't come that year until March. Cattle starved and froze to death in prairie coolies choked with deep snow drifts. When spring came, Montana cattlemen estimated they had lost 60% of their herds during the winter. That death toll was 362,000 head. That fall, steers sent to the Chicago market brought less than $25 a head. Many big outfits went bankrupt and abandoned Montana. The brief era of the great open-range cattle days was over. The brutal lesson of the winter of 1886-87 was clear. It was time for smaller herds, fenced ranches, and winter feeding. The mounted, free-spirited cowboy of the cattle drive days now had some new chores, like putting up hay and fixing fence. A lot of the cowboys headed south to thaw out and find work, but some of the cowhands from those big outfits stayed around and eventually got started on their own. Montana's cattle industry recovered and family ranches prospered. Some of their descendants are still ranching the same land today. For the last 100 years, it has always been a game of year-to-year -year survival. When Montana's statehood centennial rolled around in 1989, some folks had a vision of how to celebrate it. And what a vision it was. The old-time range cowboy and the roots of Montana's beef industry would be best remembered by recreating a genuine cattle drive. The idea was hatched by two well-known Montana comic strip artists, Stan Line, creator of Rick O'Shea, and Barry McWilliams of J.P. Doodles. After more than a year of planning that saw on-again, off-again, organizational and financial problems, a group of dedicated Montanans finally pulled it all together and announced the start of the Great Montana Centennial Cattle Drive from Roundup to Billings. And what a roundup it was. From all over Montana they came with their steers, saddle horses, teams, and wagons. It was the biggest mobilization of horse flesh, harness, and tack that the country had seen in years. 200 horse-drawn wagons, 2,800 cattle, more than 2,000 people on horseback and in wagons, buggies, and stagecoaches. This 20th century wagon train and cattle drive didn't start in Texas or Missouri. Folks from places like Ekalaka, Whitewater, Jordan, and Dillon pull their mounts and outfits on trailers and trucks to the trailhead. Roundup Montana on the Muscleshell River. And there were a few of them that came from places like New York and Denmark. For many folks, it was maybe the best chance in their lifetime to relive a colorful chapter right out of the Old West. You're not going to see it again. That's true. You know, and uh, it'll be fun. Uh, what was the nickname I heard him call you? Oh, this little guy? Yeah. He calls me Magpie because I call him Magpie because I think he was vaccinated with a phonograph movie when he was little. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this has really been quite an adventure for Oh, everybody. it's all right. Yeah, it's an adventure. That's uh, what we're here for. I hope everything goes really great for you. It ought to. Yeah. Yeah. Pray the Lord keeps everybody safe. That's all we need. <laughs> The little town of Roundup in South Central Montana had never seen so much activity. People from all around the country and all around the world who had heard about the Great American Drive came to see and participate in the largest assembly of horses, wagons, and cattle gathered in a century. The community was bustling with centennial activity. It was quite a mixture of old and new. Traffic planning, two-way radios, cellular telephones, there were cattle breeds here that hadn't even been invented a hundred years ago. Oh, I think it's tremendous. Absolutely tremendous. I'm so excited. I'm glad. I never wore a hat in my life. So and you're from Montana. That's right. I'm from <laughs> When the I first boy. got acquainted with him, he used to wear a big black hat just like that. You're fitting. <laughs> you're fitting. <laughs> you're fitting. <laughs> you want a picture of a full one right there at the bull with you?
Great American Drive began with a parade of hand-picked Texas-style trophy longhorns. The lead herd steers were then followed by miles of wagons, outriders, and horses. lead herd of 100 Longhorns. Then the wagon train and outriders made the unforgettable parade through Roundup, then headed down Highway 87. Before a cattle drive, there's always a Roundup. In the 1880s, each fall, ranchers would gather up the cattle and cut out the fattened ones and trail them to the railhead. In the spring, Cattle are gathered up for earmarking, branding, and castration. Branding is a tradition that dates back centuries. Cowboys herd the cattle to a central point marked by a fire that's hot and the coals are glowing. The brand ends are red with heat. The boss yells a command and the best cowboys who are good ropers cut out a calf, drag it toward the fire while another one grabs the critter and tosses it to the ground. The hot iron is pressed into the calf's flanks, usually on the left hip and the bovine balls. An old cowpoke went riding out one dark and windy day Upon a ridge he rested as he went along his way All at once a mighty herd of red-eyed cows he saw Plowing through the ragged skies and up a cloudy draw their friends were still on fire and their hooves were made of steel. Their horns are black and shiny and their hot breath he could feel. A bolt of beer went through him as they thundered through the sky. For he saw the riders coming hard and he heard the mournful cries. Yep, he Faces gaunt, their eyes are blurred, their shirts all soaked with sweat. They're riding hard to catch that herd, but they ain't caught them yet. They've got to ride forever on that range up in the sky. On horses snorting fire, cause they ride on here their prize. Yep, he Back at the cattle drive, the wagon train was heading south on the highway, and the main herd was moving through the Bull Mountain. Just like back in the old trail drive days, the Wranglers were joined by chuck wagons and bedroll wagons, and of course, a remuda of loose saddle horses. Back in the 1930s, the dads and granddads of these Wranglers might have been out gathering up the many wild horses that roamed Montana. Motorized agriculture and failed homesteads put thousands of horses out of work. There were so many wild horses that hungry cowboys during the Depression could make a few dollars rounding them up. herd and the remuda of loose Wrangler horses were moving south through the Bull Mountains. It was a river of beef, Longhorn, Corriente, Angus, Hereford, Watusi, crossbreeds of all kinds, thousands of cattle from all over Montana, 
Like the people and horses, they were strangers getting acquainted. The cattle were going to be traveling through mostly dry country. This year, there was plenty of grass for them along the way, and water trucks came out to fill troughs where there were no ponds. On this first day out on the trail, they seemed anxious to get to the Billings auction yards. The main herd was up and moving early and was way out in front of the wagon train. By midday, the herd was out of the hills and onto the highway. Then, it was only a couple of more miles to the bedding ground. There would be feed, water, and rest for thousands of cattle at the end of their first day together. Many of the wagons were a hundred years old and had been down rougher trails than this. Their owners put a lot of work into restoring these old wagons. They were hoping that the ancient wooden spokes and the iron tires would stand up to the five-day trip. There was no AAA road service for two-horsepower Studebakers and Conestogas. A lot of thirsty, saddle-sore people were ready to dismount, water their horses, and head for the beer tent and chuck wagons. The weather was holding, and any problems would get worked out by tomorrow. Well, I've been here 
thinking about it for about a year. I just knew one way or other I was going to have to be on it. They say that there hasn't been this many horses gathered since Sitting Bull fought Custer. to ride a, a, a bad horse one mile just kills me. Oh, yeah. You know, they're all good, but one of them idiots, I just soon. I kind of get a kick out breaking the green one, but... Yeah, my horse wasn't too bad. It just doesn't understand the word, whoa. Well, oh, my like, dad, I say, say whoa, he said, oh, thank God, we finally get a stop. Yeah, I lost the saddle this morning with a guest. We never saw him again. <laughs> <laughs> went under Pinnell's belly and the way she went. We haven't seen her since. This morning when they were rounding up the horses? No, when they were down there getting the saddle out. Getting ready to go now at the camp. See, we're oh, in yeah. a media group I'm sitting on the hill up there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Looked up and here come a horse and saddle under his belly. There goes into every machine. I take his chin out. I get my well, he was short and fat and rode out of the west with a Morgan David on his silver vest, and he was mean and nasty right clear through, which was kind of weird, because he was yellow, too, and they called him Irving. A big fat He was the 142nd fastest gun in the west. <laughs> well, he came from the old barn, left me spread needle slop and salami and butter little bread. Always followed his mother's wishes, even out on the range, he used two sets of dishes. And they called him her. Big batter. He was the 142nd fastest gun in the West. 141 more faster than me. Irvin was looking for 143. They walked to the like the man insane. The other two fingers and two things played in the hall of Irvin. A big batter. He was the 142nd fastest gun in the West. Well, the James boys were coming to town the next dawn, and the town said, Irvin, we need your gun. But the train pulled in at the crack of dawn. Irvin's guns were there, but Irvin was gone. And they called him Irvin. Big batter. He was the 142nd fastest gun in the West. Well, finally, Irvin got three slugs in the belly. He was right outside the frontier deli. Irvin was sitting there twirling his gun around. Their butterfingers, Irvin, he gunned himself down. <laughs> A big batter. On the second morning out, the wagon train and outriders headed out for their last day on the pavement before traveling through the sagebrush prairie. Participants were already becoming good friends, and the morale was high. Thank you, my dear. I probably have that around for most of it. I'm trying to keep the morale up. Meanwhile, the cattle were back on the trail, trucking through the tall, bladed grass and sandy rock ridges. Traveling several miles a day, the livestock on the trip developed quite a thirst and an appetite. By the end of day two, the cattle and horses had gone through 110 tons of hay, 400,000 gallons of water. Seven horses were injured, but they were well taken care of with over 20 veterinarians on hand. 100 of Montana's most experienced and respected cowhands drove the main herd up and down the hills of pine and sand rocks, across the grassy ridges and through the narrow draws. It was no trail ride for these riders. It was authentic cowboy work, up at daybreak and into the saddle, just like back home on the ranch. Besides the century of statehood, these Montana ranchers had a few more reasons to celebrate in 1989. 1988 was the last and worst of several dry, hot years. There was drought and fires, and then came a long and cold winter. Arctic blizzards brought hay shortages and calving losses, but the spring of 1989 greened up nicely with snowmelt and rain. Many hadn't seen the ranges look this good in 10 years. The cattle market was up, too. It looked like they were going to make it through another year. The 
cattle are proud in, the coyotes are howling, way out where the doggies roam. Where spurs are a jingling, a cowboy is singing his lonesome cattle call. Sun till his day's work is done, and he rounds up the cattle each fall. Singing his cattle call. For hours he would ride on the range far and wide, where the night wind blows up a squall. His heart is a feather in all kinds of weather. He sings his cattle call. The cattle herd was as large as any that were driven northward before Montana became a state. This required top professional drovers. Each of the state's 56 counties sent one of its best. Men and women who were chosen not for their flash or connections, but for their ability to move herds on their own spread. But even experienced cowboys can lose control of the livestock. 25 horses escaped and made their way back to Roundup. Also during that day, two horses and two cattle died. The cattle moved out of the rocky pine hills and onto the prairie to camp at the 30-mile ranch. The wind gusted up, turning the air into a blizzard of prairie dust, scaring off some of the livestock while others were undaunted. The Teamsters were busy tying down the canvas on their wagons. Two days on the paved highway could take a toll on horse feet, but it was no problem for the hoof doctors. They finished the last stretch of highway by the end of the next day. They were almost out of the hilly pine country. Everybody was looking forward to a fun night in camp before hitting a genuine prairie trail in the morning. Each day, organizers set up a 100 by 200 foot beer tent. The red and white shelters served as commons for press conferences, announcements, drinking, and dancing. Tonight, it was the old-time fiddlers. of Montana riders held their wedding right in the middle of the party at the 30-mile camp. Thank you. 
fire, ain't much light. We got some good people, good music here tonight. Foxy and I got run off of the Wrangler girl, this morning. Girl and... <laughs> my horse is too mean. But instead of being mad about it, I think Charlie Russell would be proud of me. Because this, this is probably what would have happened to him if he'd yeah. been on that Wrangler. I didn't hire on here to be the best Wrangler out here anyway. I came out to have fun, play a little music. Ride home, or ride to yourself, and give it back to us, and we'll go on Pony Express tomorrow and Friday. <laughs> and when you get it back, it'll have a Pony Express cancellation on it, stamp cancellation on it, so that you know that it was on the Pony Express. A Pony Express rider rushed the mail from camp and relayed it down the line for a special commemorative postmark. On the third day, they headed out across the wide expanse of prairie called Hoskins Basin. Across big sky brush, prickly pear cactus, and gumbo dust. Injuries on the drive seemed to be more mythical than real, but several people were hurt, including a Montana astronaut when his horse reared up and he rolled down a steep embankment. Now, this happened to more than one experienced rider on the trail, but... Every good cowboy knows it's a good idea to keep a tight cinch on your saddle. Check the cinch on that horse, will you? Check the cinch on him. I got a horse. This one's all right. Let's take this boot off. It's okay. That one's okay. Okay, well, can you lay it down? Can you lay this one down? Oh, Can you get it down? Uh, lay it right on the ground. That's uh, yeah, fine. I don't think anything is broke. It's just uh, sprained. Uh, down here. That's yeah, fine. It's past the ankle. Okay. Right up here. Oh, uh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, you're, getting, found it. you're getting close now. Some of the horses were also injured on the drive, and even a few died, some of them from digestive upset, but mainly the injuries to horses were cuts from barbed wire. It's tremendous meeting all the people from all over the country, Ooh. all over the world. Uh -huh. you know, it's, that, to me, is the best part. Mm -hmm. you know, the, for whatever shortcomings it has, you know, the chance to meet so many different people makes up for it.
Let her down if she would only smile. <laughs> By gosh, it was fun. <laughs> but I have a problem. I can see it now. I can. It's going to take some mighty sweet talking when that light burns out again. <laughs> <laughs> team pulled by 10 horses was having trouble making up the hills. We pulled the team and the wagons up along with the, up the hill with the 4x4 four four ambulance. Later on in the day, the front wheel broke on the first wagon. So they left that wagon back about three miles up camp and uh, we, we pulled in the rest of the, the crew, the three wagons with the ambulance here. Camp. The horseback riders and wagon trains were supported by a volunteer medical staff. Trucks hauling hay and water, and a caterer with a chuck wagon truck set up to feed 5,000 people. The fourth morning of the cattle drive brought sunny skies as the outfits broke camp and moved out across the Charter Ranch. Montana is the big sky country. It's the heart and soul of the of Montana in the mountains, valleys, and skies. And that is why I love Montana with a love that never will die. Snow-capped mountains, fertile valleys, here is bigness and beauty as well. With such grandeur and such beauty, it's no wonder I'm under a spell. Montana is the big sky country, and from here I never will roam. I'm proud Montana is my country, and will be forever my home. Snow-capped mountains, fertile valleys, here is bigness and beauty as well. Such grandeur and such beauty, it's no wonder I'm under a spell. Montana is the big sky country, and from here I never will roam. I'm proud Montana is my country, and will be forever my home. This big sky On a deep, dusty back road, eight miles to the Bull Mountain foothills, a steep grade proved to be a challenge to the 208 wagons. Some teams had trouble pulling the loaded vehicles over the grade. At times, outriders had to tie ropes to the wagon tongues to pull them over the hump. It held up the wagon train with some coming in as much as three hours late. It was a great journey back into yesterday. You get a comforting perspective while sitting on a creaking wagon seat or up in an old A-fork saddle, but even then, we can't change the view of the landscape of the new west. It's hard to ignore the big power lines carrying electricity generated from Montana coal, coal dug from former range land. Power for Los Angeles, another chapter in Montana's history.
There you go. He's calling you. Somebody is. Hello? This is him. It's modern convenience out on the prairie, folks. It's all just part of the sights and sounds of the new West. The old West lives on inside these riders. It was quite a sight to see several miles of wagons, cattle, and horses stirring up the dust on the sagebrush prairie. For many who were in the Great American Drive, it was a chance of a lifetime, something they would never see or do again. A dream of simpler times that had become a reality with the rattling and creaking of the wagons and the melodic sound of the hooves trotting along the dry ground, it was a great satisfaction for everyone involved to see, finally, the event in progress after almost a year and a half of planning, controversy, and doubt that the drive would even ever come off. Ah, well, you just feel the ground shaking when those Belgians go through. Yeah. Boy, are you enjoying the drive? Oh, tremendously. A little bit of history, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. we're part of history right here, you know, and we'll never see it again. Never, never. Something no, tell, this is quite a thing. Something to tell the grandchildren. You bet. Well, Not everyone rode on the great cattle drive. Why is this fiddle player walking through the sagebrush? I call it a reconnaissance. Good. Not a renaissance, a reconnaissance. Because it's a look back, a look at what was before so that we can see what might be before us if we are to, if it is for us to go on. And with a day like today, if, if we're not, if the big one happened right now, I'd just say, you bet. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I understand you're walking the whole thing. Oh, not the whole thing. I took a ride in the wagon the second day. The fourth day was one of the longest trails of the week. On this day, both the wagons and the cattle traveled together. At times, the procession stretched out for over seven miles. It was also an opportunity for the unmounted public to get a look from the road. The cattle drive spectacle attracted thousands of curious spectators that day to see the long expanse of century-old methods of travel slightly disguised by the rising dust moving slowly and methodically along gave you a mystical feeling that you were gazing back at a hundred years in time. And when that anachronistic sight was paralleled by the fast-moving traffic on the highway, it reinforced the feeling that the past had somehow come to the present. The riders and wagoners kept moving through the sage, savoring these dusty moments. They could enjoy their own world for a while longer. As the wagon started rolling into the camp, there were enough days on the trail that the participants were starting to miss their showers and the modern day conveniences. But the spirits were still high and the travelers were looking forward to big name entertainment tonight from Nashville. When the wagons roll into camp, they form circles designated by colors, red, brown, white. The circles become the center of social activity. Originally, they were formed for protection. Dick Walker, president of the Ladigo Corporation, the group that organized the Great American Drive, said he had to sneak out of camp for some important business. I went and got a bath today. I cheated. Yeah, I'll tell you. Yeah, oh, I'll tell you what. Washed the grit out of my teeth, shaved the hair off my face, and I'll tell you what, I feel like a new man. So a lot of these people on the trail, they don't have much opportunity to do that then, huh? I think we got showers out there. They can take showers, and uh, I think I'm sure that they're finding that they've got a lot of the conveniences they need. They certainly seem to be hanging in there. They were skinny dipping in the stock tanks last year. Right? Yeah. This was family night. 
a chance for friends and relatives and anyone else to drive out, park in the sagebrush, and have a look at the wagon train camp, live music, beer, cowboys and cowgirls, way out here on the prairie, but nobody expected such interest. 20,000 people came to visit the camp. Cars were backed up for miles. 5,000 others had to be turned back that night. The Old West was nearly smothered by curiosity. What do you think about the cattle drive? We think it's going great. We're really surprised that it's gone out with all of them. Yeah. Which one she's going to camp out with? <laughs> Whoa. What's your favorite memory? I got roped by a cowboy. You got roped by a I cowboy? I got roped by a cowboy, and he tried to drag me off. On the last night out on the prairie, the cattle drive folks knew they had experienced something special. It's just so neat seeing all these voices and people and the good times and the camaraderie among everybody and it's something that I've never seen before in my life. It's a rolling party. It doesn't look like city, does it? This is not the city. I went into the city last night and I missed being out here on the trail. On the fifth morning out, it rained. Folks getting breakfast grub from the caterer's big chuck wagon truck sought shelter from the weather under the beer tent. Feeding the participants was a big chore. One night, caterers served up 3,000 pounds of beef ribs and a half a ton of baked beans, all from a mobile 35-foot propane and electric kitchen. That's equivalent to four cows on the hoof. Each morning, they would get their share of biscuits and gravy, bacon and eggs, hot cakes with maple syrup, and plenty of hot, high-calf coffee, up to 500 gallons a day. You're in the trash, lady. Can you believe that? Here, let me put that back on your hand. <laughs> well, the first thing you got to do is milk it. Folks, how often do you see a saddle tied like this? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 this is the way to tie your saddle. Well, sure. you go. <laughs> good, yeah. well that, that's how we register them. Yep. First with the video camera and the cellular <laughs> telephone. That is one modern day cowboy. Hey, <laughs> hey folks. They headed out for one long last pull over a big prairie butte. Those long cowboy duster coats and silk scarves came in handy against the chilly wind. Our great parade of horsepower was now only a few miles away from the smoke and clang of civilization and the end of the wide open trail. For many riders, 
Each step closer to town took them a little bit farther away from the pioneer experience of the past few days. The journey was packed with memories, but it passed quickly. There would be one more camp on the edge of town before the parade rolled into Billings. As the Yellowstone River Valley slowly spread out before them in the cold wind blew, it was a time for reflection. Once they made it over the butte, they were on their last stretch of the trail. Before hitting the last camp, the procession was momentarily held up, and the wagons moved a little slower and stayed closer together. Organizers were working out the final details of the parade through Billings the next day. Meanwhile, the cattle were up and moving ahead of the wagon train. The cattle were owned by the participants. In order to partake in the drive, you had to cosign or enter a dry cow or steer. Many of them were rented from Montana ranchers and outfitters. I think you want to go through that gate over there, don't you, Jay? Okay. Right over here. No, 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 the, the cows go through that gate. <laughs>
the bolt of fear which blew him as they thundered to the sky. For he saw the riders coming hard, and he heard their mournful cry. The cattle were the unsung heroes of the journey. They weren't used to traveling nine miles a day, and surprisingly, many of them had never seen a horse before. Like the people, they were strangers getting acquainted. The participants had developed lasting friendships and took home memories. Many of those associated with the drive felt that there was divine guidance and protection of the event. Injuries were rare and mostly minor, despite what one cowboy called a thousand wrecks a day that didn't quite happen, an event meant to celebrate the history of the American cowboy had become history itself. One of the original organizers of the drive, Jim Wetner, says he was pleased with the way the drive came off. I'm very, very pleased with it. I'm, like I say, I'm... Uh... Yeah, there was a lot of skeptics at first, but uh, everybody that I've talked to so far is just loving it. Right, there were skeptics, but on the other hand, I don't know... I never talked to across anyone that didn't want it to happen. Yeah. They, they were skeptics that might not happen, but they wanted it to happen. That's a good point. I thought it was kind of a joke, just a bunch of horse lovers wanting to ride. But as this thing built, and watching it and then seeing it Thursday night, seeing all these guys unable to have any modern conveniences, of showers and shaving and having to live the way they did, and then uh, watching them come into Billings, 
a lot of them were not relieved that it was over. Oh, no. Yeah. They did not so. want to come back up Someone 100 years right to 1989. Around, you know, one, one guy I wow. wished that I had on tape, I thought about it, I was just kind of feeling things out. It was a Calvary guy after we left the Heights. And I asked him, you know, how I felt about it after it was all over. And he says it's like going to camp. It remind, reminds me of being a kid and going to church camp or some kind of camp. <coughs> well, and you all make friends <coughs> with each other, and you don't expect it to happen, but then when it's all over, it's sad. Saturday morning, a wet snowstorm cleared off, and more than 20,000 people lined Bain Street and Billings Heights to watch the great Montana Centennial Cattle Drive come through town. <laughs> The day before, people wanting to see the parade park motor homes and campers along the street, spectators streamed in from all over. Traffic officers braced themselves for gridlock. The post office canceled mail service for this part of town. It seemed that everybody had heard about the cattle drive and wanted to see it for themselves. On this day, however, the cattle drive came to the spectators. children on horseback and in the wagons had reason to feel proud. They were performers in Montana's biggest demonstration of centennial pageantry. They were ranch people, small town people, city people, dudes and cowpokes. It had been their trip back into yesteryear and now was their big moment to show the world with one last ride together. Thank you. 
always a privilege to share the best show in the United States yeah, with you. Yeah. Yeah. culmination of dreams, plans, work, and cooperation by a whole bunch of dedicated people. It looked like Montana had produced the biggest Western ever staged, and it was all live. While the horses and cattle drifted off for loading on trucks and trailers, about half the cattle were driven under the railroad to the public auction yards. The other bunch were driven across the Yellowstone River Bridge to the Billings Livestock Sales Yard. Shepherd, huh? Great, great. I've got it now. We're trying to organize another one. <laughs> All right. All right. We're going to have a much more on it. Don't think there. everybody's standing out here. Well, <laughs> well, we'll have year? a lot more people this time because all these people want to go next yeah. time. Yeah, right. Next year? Well, maybe uh, next week. All right. <laughs> the, only, the only problem that I didn't like was all the people in our camps. <laughs> we could have kept them out of it just right. Oh, it was all exciting. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like that auction team over there. What have you thought so far of the cattle drive? It was great. I wish they'd do it every five years or so. Oh. You know, I said it was a walking museum. I mean, things were coming out of the woodwork, and people were getting their grandfather's saddle and their sh old shaps and old pairs of spurs and wrist cuffs. And, and uh, I mean, it was a living museum of old cowboy equipment from the Plains area, mainly Montana, uh, dating back, uh, you know, 100 years or more. Mike Story was with us, and of course, his great-great-grandfather was the first cattleman to trail cattle into, into uh, Montana from Texas, and he was riding a saddle that was a very early generation saddle that came out of California uh, with his grandfather, I think, on a horse drive. Uh, I was riding a saddle that was made by the Yagen brothers here in Billings, you know, almost a territorial age saddle. Uh, our group uh, were allowed to carry guns, and uh, you know my 44-40 revolver 
and rifle were all a hundred years or older. And uh, I mean, that was true all over, you know, the drive. So did you ever feel like you were going back a hundred years? Well, I think it, it uh, you know, we did have the advantage of having some modern conveniences not too far away from us, but, um, and for those of that are in the, in the industry, you know, riding 10 miles a day is no big deal. But, you know, to see that many horses and that many people and that many cattle and that many wagons together, uh, you just don't see that. And, and then the feeling that it created. And I mean, there was from the beginning, once the drive started, from the minute it started, there was a feeling that the little problems didn't matter this is great, and uh, everybody got along, and and uh, I think your video s captures that feeling that the people had. I mean, I know for a fact that some people didn't have hay, and they had paid for it, and some people didn't have toilets, and you know, so not everything really went right. But again, the the big picture was, hey, this is really great. So what did you think? Just before it, it, it went off, I mean, a lot of people had doubts that this thing was even going to come off. Did you ever have any doubts? Or oh, yeah. You had, feeling right well, you had to have before? doubts. You had to have doubts uh, about the drive. Uh, it was a big project. It took a lot of management, a lot of planning. Uh, it took a lot of money. Uh, I wasn't, per se, in the inside, but uh, there were some times <laughs> 30, 60 days beforehand, I don't know, then I think it was a touch-and-go situation. The thing that, besides the hard work that all the volunteers did and all the leaders of Latigo and, and the business people and Billings and Roundup, you know, what is there, 1,200 volunteers with this thing that we know about? Uh, but the thing that really made it work is that the Mon people of Montana and their friends and visitors that came had the horses, had the gear, had the horse trailers, had the trucks, knew how to use them, had the wagons, had the teams, had the harness. And if you had to sit down and plan all that and tell everybody how to do it, it would have never come off. They just went and did it. Many of the event's cattle were loaded up and shipped back home to their owners. Others were held and run through the auction ring. Some of the proceeds from the cattle sales were donated to the Montana Rural Development Fund, main beneficiary of all extra centennial cattle drive revenues. <laughs> The two men who dreamed up the great Montana Centennial cattle drive were pleased that their vision took shape. Barry McWilliams and stay in line. Well, it was a real high, I, I guess, for me, uh, to see how much it meant to the people, Barry, don't you think? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Uh, people coming up and, and saying thank you with tears in their eyes. Mm -hmm. you know, thanks for the show and thanks for, for, for coming up with this idea. Boy. The gratitude was worth every every bit of it. Uh, the gratitude, we, you know, we as uh, we mean in all of us participants. Uh. Most of the people I talked to uh, wish the trail could go on just a little longer. Another couple days is what you heard. Right. I think overall, what what strikes me most is that uh, I don't know. There's a, there was a spiritual quality to this to this whole idea, and I can see now that all all through it, I can see that somebody up there wanted a cattle drive for sure. Uh, Strong idea. Uh, it was a series of miracles. Every day there were miracles. Started off with that double rainbow and round yes, up that night. exactly right. And then the night of the big concert when it didn't rain on all that Nashville equipment. Right. And uh, when it didn't rain or get mucky, you know, uh, at all on the trail and the wagons didn't get bogged down at all, things just rolled right along. And, uh, boy, you could just uh, thank your lucky stars that, you, that it came off that way. Uh, I'm not exactly ready to do it again, though. <laughs> I think we might well, be tempting I, fate. I think there were some people, you know, there was that feeling that they'd like, for some of them, that they'd like to have it go on. <clears throat> but I think that's just like anything you want to leave on that note. You don't want them to be to, to people to say, thank God that's over. You know, they, they really weren't. But it was a special time, and I think it ended at just the right time and in just the right way.
as he went along his way. When all at once a mighty herd of red eyed cows he saw plowing through the ragged sky in the cloudy draw. Their breath was still on fire and their hooves are made of steel. Their horns black and shiny and their hot breath they could feel. And the bolt of fear went through them as they thundered through the sky. Where he saw the riders coming hard. And he heard their mongrel cry. Across the dragon sky. 